Hi, my name is Willie Welch. You're welcome to Westville and you're welcome to Westport. We're delighted to be collaborating with the Belfast International Arts Festival to host seven inspirational written word pieces for the 2020 programme. We love working with people who are committed to telling transformative stories. Nothing could be more transformative than the two pieces of work that Una Malali will be talking to Nazir and to Kevin about. We love books and we love the people who tell us about books. We love our bookshops, we love our libraries, we love our book clubs. Westville would like to thank the Belfast International Arts Festival for bringing this opportunity to us. We'd like to thank all the artists that are participating. We look forward to further collaboration over the next couple of years. Here's to the artists, here's to Westville, and here's to the Belfast International Arts Festival. I hope you enjoy. Welcome everyone to what will hopefully be a fascinating chat with two really, really uh, interesting people and their two, I mean, amazing uh, books. Um, Kevin Maxwell is a former detective and author of Forced Out, a memoir about his experience in the police force and the racism and homophobia he experienced there, as well as offer, offering a fascinating insight into the institutional culture of policing. And Nazir Azal is a solicitor who has occupied multiple positions in the Crime Prosecution Service, including the Chief Crime Prosecutor for the Northwest England. He's worked on a phenomenal uh, array of cases, including those of gender-based violence, child exploitation, uh, so-called honor killings and slavery. He's the author of The Prosecutor. Um, as like, I'm trying to, I have to hold them up in a certain way to, to hide the tea stains on them um, as I've been <laughs> literally pouring over them. Uh, but that's always a sign of, of two well-read books. So um, welcome gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. You're welcome, thank you so much for having now, us. Be before we uh, get into to this discussion, we're gonna be talking for around 45-ish minutes, but I thought um, for some context for people who, who've not yet the, read the books, if you both wouldn't mind reading um, a little part just to give us a flavour. Um, Nazir, if you want to go first, mm. if you've got something there. and um, I have. Thank you so much, you know. I mean, the ch I've, I've, there are lots of cases in the book, but I wanted to talk about my personal story. And uh, we went to, when I was eight years old, my father took me and my whole family to Pakistan across the land. And we we're coming back. And I had my seven-year-old cousin, I was eight. And this is our journey back. The next day we set off. The sun was only just beginning to rise over Peshawar when dad woke us up in the early hours. He was eager to get on the road, throwing our bags into the back of the van as mum closed up the house. I could see the determined look in his eye and it made me nervous. He turned the keys and the engine roared into life immediately. Without even so much as a glance back, dad accelerated down the dirt road, pebbles and dust billowing out behind us as we headed to Afghanistan and through Iran, through Turkey on a journey back to Europe. The van hummed with speed, and this journey seemed much quicker than the one that brought us to Pakistan. Something wasn't right, however. By the time we reached Germany, Yasmin, my cousin, had become ill, sickness descending on her out of nowhere. Her plaintive sobs went straight to my heart, but we had no idea what was wrong with her or what to do. Mum cradled her head and tried to soothe her. Dad watched anxiously through the rearview mirror. Very soon we'd be back in England, he said, and then we'd go to the doctor. We had no idea, though how serious things truly were. Eventually, Yasmin seemed to ease, her crying quietened, and the back of the van, having her, having her hair stroked by mum, resting in her lap, she seemed calmer, as though she were getting better. Eventually, she stopped crying altogether, and I drifted in, out, in and out of sleep. We were close, I knew, to the port of Ostend, and that would take us back to England. I was jolted awake as we came to a halt at the entrance to the port. It was then that next to me, my mother stiffened, seeming almost to stop breathing. Nazir, she said very softly, I need to speak to your father. That's an extraordinary piece of writing and I think, uh, you know, goes some way to show the kind of the tenderness and the humanity with which you write and also how so much of your work is rooted in these um, kind of early personal uh, milestones, which is um, 
a correlation with your writing too, Kevin. I was wondering if you could uh, read something there. Thank you for that, Nazir. Yep. Um, I think with everything that's happening in the world at the moment with regards to the Black Lives Matter movement, I thought I'd actually read um, the author's note, which I uh, placed at the beginning of my book. That's the reasons um, I wrote the book. And then I could just read a couple of pages from the beginning. On a summer's afternoon, I fell ill and collapsed at Heathrow Airport. At the time, I was working as a detective in the Counter-Terrorism Command at London's Metropolitan Police, having transferred as a detective from the Criminal Investigation Department at Greater Manchester Police. Afterwards, my life and how I saw the world around me changed. I began to think about how the culture in policing impacted communities when it came to crime and terrorism and the effect prejudice and discrimination had on staff. I was forced to speak out, but it came with devastating consequences. Forced out is my account of what happened in the years leading up to my illness, as well as during and after it. It is about making sense of my 11 years on the force and finding closure so that I can embrace the present. We consider America to have a terrible record for racism in the police without acknowledging what is going on closer to home in Britain. Brutality, racism and the denial of civil liberties in the UK simply don't receive the same sort of scrutiny. I hope this book will contribute to changing that. And then if I just go to the beginning, um, which um, I always enjoy the beginning because it's, you know, where I, where I start uh, my journey in life. In July 1981, three months after my third birthday, riots broke out in my neighbourhood, Toxteth, one of Britain's most deprived urban areas. A former royal choice, Chase, it is now an inner city part of Liverpool, within walking distance of the city centre and the banks of the River Mersey. Like my parents, the white Liverpool Irish mother and a black West Indian father, immigrants from all over the world had flocked to Liverpool for a better life. Some came to Britain after it had colonised their countries. Others came after defending the country during the Second World War to help rebuild the nation. For so many tired feet, home was my city. Liverpool's Chinese community is the oldest in Europe and its black community the oldest in the UK. Liverpool, Britain's biggest former slave port and birthplace of the Beatles, was a multicultural melting pot, a hub of people who looked different, spoke differently, and even smelled different. Many settled in Toxic because of its proximity to the city centre and the seafront. But over the years, the culturally diverse communities in and around Toxic had faced prejudice, hostility, and misdirected anger. By the time of the Toxic riots, the hundreds of mainly black, brown, and poor white people had had enough of being over-policed, criminalized, and forgotten by the British establishment. I was only a young child, but I have some vivid memories of the riots. I watched the smoke billowed and cops jumped out of Black Mariahs, the big police vans used to transport prisoners, dressed in traditional helmets and tunics, carrying thick wooden truncheons and plastic riot shields. Rioters were chased around my estate, and when they were caught, retribution was swift and brutal. The riots were some of the worst urban riots anywhere in the world during the 20th century, and the first time British police used incapacitant spray on the mainland to control civil unrest. You would have thought that witnessing this so early on in my life would have turned me against the police, like so many other young men, especially young black and brown men, growing up in, in deprived areas, but it didn't. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, I think like in, in both of your books, there are these like hugely evocative starting points about place and how that informs identity. And I just wanted to start by asking you, by bringing it back to that and, and asking you both like the places you grew up in, how would you characterize how they formed your personal political motivation or your personal politic? Nazir? Uh, well, well, for my part, I mean, I was born in Birmingham and in the city of Birmingham uh, a lot, many, many years before uh, Kevin, uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, racism of the type that um, just been alluded to was, was uh, overt. I mean, I, 
I think many of us who, who lived in the 60s and 70s of colour uh, were very good sprinters. We were running from race attacks on a regular basis. I mean, there was so much crime as well. You know, um, I didn't have neighbours, I had witnesses. There was just so much crime. Uh, I was born in the shadow of a football club, I mean, the city football club. The skinheads were on the street. Um, we were Im new, new immigrants, or my, fam my father was, and I was born here, but we felt, always felt at some point, somebody would knock on the door and say, go home. Uh, they were saying that to us in the streets anyway, but I think there was a, a view at some point uh, we would leave. And, you know, I talk about the number of times I was attacked and abused, the amount of abuse and violence that I saw. And of course that would have impacted on me. I think it made me realize and appreciate what it was like to be a victim. Uh, obviously I dealt with more serious victims in my time, but I, I was a victim myself, I guess, well I was. Uh, and at the same time, I, I think I realized what my father thought, God bless him, uh, he, he said it to me. He said, there's no justice. Nobody's gonna listen to you. Not because of the color of your skin, because of your working class, because of the background you come from, the schools you go to, you're not gonna be listened to at all. What is the point in having a justice system? And I suspect part of that, in the same way I think Kevin just mentioned, um, it was almost like, I'm going to do something about it, you know? Um, I'm going to ensure that people like me don't have to go through what I went through. What about you, Kevin? Does that ring bells for you as well? Yeah, I was nodding along. I mean, it's, it's really um, striking that so many like people of colour in Britain, particularly uh, Black and Asian communities, you know, so many of us have similar journeys in the big cities, Birmingham, Liverpool, you know, London, Leeds, um, e even um, Glasgow and Cardiff. You know, our, story, our stories are so intertwined. I mean, for me, growing up in talk stuff, you know, uh, I was born just before the riots and I was seven when they actually stopped with my estate, stopped burning. Um, that has an impact on a child. But, you know, I grew up um, almost in a, not almost, in a multicultural area for me toxic was like the un the united nations you know kids had white moms black dads Asian moms, white dads and it was just everyone just got along like you know when you're a child you didn't really think about race yeah as you got older like nazia said you know you don't become aware of it because you you get called the names and stuff but growing up i had a wonderful childhood and it wasn't until actually going outside of talk stuff you know to the wider living pool that you realize actually you are different and people remind you that you're different. But I guess for my mum, particularly, you know, a white woman in inner city Liverpool, raising 11 children, I'm the last of 11 children. You know, there's not much that she hadn't been called and she hadn't heard. Um, and I guess, you know, as she sort of uh, progressed through the children and got to me, you know, I guess she just made sure that um, I didn't, not so much make the same mistakes as people in my community, but you know, especially coming from inner cities, there's usually only two ways you can go, you know, on the right side of the law as, as such and on the wrong side. And my mum was a loving woman, but she was also a disciplinarian. And, you know, she shaped my um, understanding of the difference between right and wrong, which um, as he is saying, you know, people in my community didn't join the police. Boys like me, little, you know, brown boys who knew they were different in terms of their sexuality, you didn't join the police. You know, police were the people you, on my estate, who chased you around, um, you know, the uh, around housing estate. You didn't join them. And I guess that was probably strange to many of my um, friends in Toxif as to why uh, I wanted to join the force. But I, I mean, as he said, I said it, you know, it was my, I wanted to make a difference. It was my, it was my bit, you know, doing some good for my community. I, I joined with a genuine passion to, uh, want to make a difference. No one joins to want to change it. You just want to join to help people, you know. That, that's, mm. that, was, that was why I did it. Early on in your book, um, Kevin, you write, um, well, you're talking very, uh, or you're, you write very evocatively about that kind of, almost kind of an obsession with the police, like naming your Lego figures after characters from the bill and things like that. Um, one of the things that you wrote that I thought was very mm. profound, and I want to tease it out with you is, you said, I didn't want to be one of those people who hated the police. And I want to know, why did you have that thought? You know, it wasn't until writing the book, and uh, Nazir would probably be able to, uh, uh, you know, agree with me on this, like, when you're laying it all down, you know, you have time to reflect on, you know, on your past and 
how it did shape you. And it wasn't until writing Foresaw that I realized, actually, you know, I'd almost put things to the back of my mind and ignored things. So I'd seen the police growing up mistreat black and brown people on my house and estate and poor white people. I'd seen that with my own eyes. I'm, I'm from Toxteth, you know, from Liverpool. I lived through, you know, uh, the impact on the city with Hillsborough and stuff. You know, the police just weren't thought of highly in any particular way in my city. And I guess for me, you know, my mum often said, you know, growing up, I remember I used to say I wanted to go and visit East Europe and friends would say, why do you want to go to East Europe? It's racist. But my mum was a sort of woman who said, go and discover it for yourself. Don't listen to people, go and discover it for yourself. So on my estate, and not just on my estate, around Britain, I mean, we're really feeling it now. People had a genuine hatred for the police. And, you know, it's not something I say it lightly, but, you know, they were, it, a lot of it was warranted in terms of the mistreatment of minority communities. But my mum particularly, being a strong woman, didn't want me to be uh, consumed with hate. So she often taught me about a better path, a different path. So when I was 10, rather than hanging around the estates, um, I joined the cadet forces. I was in two cadet forces right up until the day I joined the police. That's when I left the cadet forces. So I was in the cadet forces for 13 years. You know, so that got me out of the house and I, I guess on the, on the right track. But, you know, people had a genuine dislike. I, I would say hatred for the police. And for me, I just never, never let it consume me. And I do believe the biggest influence, my biggest supporter was, was my mom. And, you know, I was allowed to play with any, um, any toys I wanted. Um, but because my mom didn't speak ill of the police, I guess that's why I became fascinated by them, that I could potentially be one of them. And, you know, just to finish off, I've often thought, that as I reflected as an adult now, I wonder whether somewhere in me, I wanted to be one of them rather than being chased by them and beaten up. I wonder whether, you know, unconsciously, I wanted to be part of the gang rather than, you know, um, mm. uh, experience any um, uh, brutality or whatever it may be, racism by the, by the police. I've often thought, I wonder whether that played a part in my journey because I, I repeat it young boys like me from my estate, even to present day, just don't join the police. Mm. It's interesting. It makes me think it's a very different thing, but um, Sarah Shulman has this book called uh, Familial Homophobia and its Consequences and frames uh, the marriage equality movement as a response to homophobia in childhood that you want to return back into a unit of acceptance. Um, there seems to be a little correlation there to be if you're ostracized, well, how do you become uh, the, the subsumed into a force where that can't necessarily happen, I suppose, although, although it still does. But, you know, it also kind of uh, calls to mind, Nazir, your um, initial work with the uh, Crime Prosecution Service, which we'll just refer to as CPS. And you wrote, uh, there was one challenge I hadn't foreseen. Virtually everyone we worked with hated us. <laughs> and I, mm -hmm. I thought that was so interesting that you were kind of getting it from all sides, yeah. from the judiciary and from the police and you know, potentially other parties as well. That transitionary period in um, the British judicial system where the CPS came in, how did that solve things, quote unquote, in some ways? And how difficult was it to to tie those um, forces that were pro probably quite a bit adversarial at the time. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the, the CPS came out of the fact that the, the Royal Commission said the police could no longer be trusted with making their own charging decisions. And uh, if you remember, we had the Birmingham Six, the Guildford Four, we had a series of miscarriages of justice. And so the idea of an independent prosecution service was created back in 1986. I joined three or four years later, uh, you can probably imagine the police hated us with a vengeance because we now have the responsibility for taking their cases independently of them. Uh, the judiciary hated the fact that there were government lawyers in the courtroom rather than barristers uh, that they were used to. Uh, the, um, uh, the 
the probation service detested the fact that they were talking to uh, these legally qualified individuals. The court service were used to the police officer standing there presenting a case. Now it was a prosecutor. The public had no understanding of this. The government at the time, which was John Major's government, uh, and the whole conservative government at that time, was not funding public services. And so we had no money. Uh, we had enormous caseloads, not enough staff. Uh, and uh, we also misunderstood our responsibilities. The law said that we were meant to be independent, but what that had been defined as is detachment. That somehow, if we were, if I was in the room with you, you might dissuade me uh, in terms of my decision making, uh, which totally misunderstands what independence is. You, can, you and I can have very independent views, but be in the same room. So we were very isolated, we were very poor, uh, we were overworked. Uh, we were disliked by every other agency and by the public and by the media. The national media were always looking for an opportunity to give us a good kicking. Uh, we were losing files. Uh, you, you name it, everything that could be going wrong was going wrong. And the response, uh, you know, the response was, for, for my part, was about engaging with the public. You know, as a public service, uh, I always used to introduce myself as I am your servant. I am your servant. And, you know, the idea is that the public need to, to understand that we're working on their behalf. With the police, it was a different kettle of fish. It was about winning their trust. And so, uh, very fortunately, I was working in central London and I would go past Scotland Yard and I'd pop in in the days where you could pop in. And I'd sit down with senior officers and say, what have you got at the moment that you're concerned about? And they would share with me in the very early stages of some investigation and I would be able to guide them and support them. Uh, and ultimately, uh, they, they warmed to that. And, and so we began to build the relationships uh, which we needed to build with policing. So they began to trust us. And then particularly me, and they were able to share with me, uh, the, you know, the serial killer cases or the, uh, the ma major frauds or the, uh, the, you know, the massive political type cases. Uh, and very quickly, I became established as somebody they could go to. And I think others began to think the same way. Uh, with the public, Literally, there's no, 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 there's no substitute for going out there all the time. And you know, I remember when we had the knife crime epidemic in the early 2000s, uh, then, uh, I remember telling my staff, right, let's go and talk to the public who are most impacted by this. Let's go and talk to young people. And they said, yes, let's invite them to our offices. Guess what? Nobody comes to your offices. You've got to go to them. And so I remember going to this bookmakers above, uh, uh, well, in Harlesden, North London. Above it, there was a group of young men wearing their bandanas across their faces. I was invited to talk to them about why they felt um, that they were being targeted and why they needed to carry knives as they felt they did. And I was listening to their concerns around policing and education and environment and edu uh, you name it, every issue you could think of. And I left and went back and I went to the Home Office and said, I've heard what they have to say. Are you gonna do something about it? And the Home Office's reaction was, Nazir, you didn't carry out a risk assessment when you went there. You shouldn't have gone there. And I'm thinking, that's the jump we had to take, that we can't simply, you know, do the same things and get the same uh, outcome. You've got to do and work differently. And so in a very short space of time, we, we, we were doing cases better. We were better funded uh, in, from 97, the 97 government, uh, and we were much more engaged with the public, and we had better relationships with the police and, and, and ultimately with the public. And I think that really uh, took four or five years or thereabouts it was bloody hard work, uh, but uh, absolutely essential. One of the cases that pops up in both of your books is the Stephen Lawrence case. And I was just wondering from both of your perspectives, what impact did that have on your kind of personal professional intersection? Um, Kevin, if you want to, to maybe answer that. I mean, for me, Stephen was just a few years older than myself. I remember being at um, high school and you got to appreciate that not long before Hillsborough had happened. So for me, I was almost going, well, I was really often going against the grain. So even when you speak to your friends, you know, by this time, I was already writing in my school uh, record of achievement that I wanted to be a policeman. And people around me just found that. I wouldn't say they used the word strange at the time, but maybe baffled as to why someone from Tuck stuff who was now in Chilwell and Chilwell School, you know, still wanted to be this policeman considering where I came from, Hillsborough, and now, you know, as we started learning more about Stephen Lawrence's, um, you know, 
horrific murder and the, the, the investigation that uh, followed or the lack of. And, you know, it was almost as if the more I heard about the police failing, the more I was determined to join. Like, I was going to um, make it better, you know, make a difference. But yeah, his, uh, Stephen's uh, murder, to this day, like so many other murders, murders you know, there's so many, uh, you know, black and brown children who've been, uh, you know, victims of race crimes in, in this co in, in the UK. Um, Stephen's the one, the one, one of the one of the names so many of us know. Um, it just it, it has a it does has a, has an effect when you're a young person. You know, it's not something I've not forgotten about it uh, to this day. Um, from when I was in um, primary school, uh, sorry, secondary school, uh, twenty years ago. Um, so yeah, it, it, things like this do shape you and then when you're an adult writing the book you wonder why almost with all those warning signs like uh hillsborough stephen lawrence you know what i saw growing up uh, in talk stuff you know why didn't i treat these as red flags as such and you know not all police clearly are bad you know there's lots of good officers out there but you know they weren't ready for someone like me. And it's almost as if I was pushing against uh, not just a closed door, a locked door. And I guess that was my, uh, that was my downfall, my Achilles heel, that, you know, it just wasn't ready for someone like me. And, you know, apart from it being an uh, awful uh, uh, killing, Stephen's death should have, and the subsequent, um, um, investigation, inquiry and report should have been uh, warning, uh, you know, warning bells for me. Mm. And I guess, um, well, I, I clearly didn't hear them because I joined, you know, uh, to, uh, not in the beginning of the um, uh, century, um, but towards the end of the 90s, you know, I listened and I watched the um, the inquiry going on in London, you know, and read the report. And that was one of the reasons why I joined Greater Manchester Police because of some of the comments uh, David Wilmot, the former chief, a former chief constable of Greater Manchester Police, said. You know, he talked about um, you know he was going to make his force different, and I really believed that I could be part of you know making it better, and it, it mm. just didn't happen. Did the determination or the intention, I suppose, for things to improve after that for you, Nazir, like did, did that really resonate effectively in the aftermath of, um, I suppose we could characterize it as the investigation? Um, mm. did, like, um, did, because it feels sometimes that these moments, you know, there's, there's this great hope for change being instigated and this could never, you know, never again is that is the reson resonance of that change true to this day uh no um i mean i was obviously prosecuting at the time of stephen's murder and i was very much aware of the poverty of the investigation that was undertaken uh when the inquiry the mcpherson inquiry at the end of the 90s looking at racism in, in society generally but also looking at lawrence came back and said that we are institutionally racist you probably remember everybody was saying the chief commissioner the chief constable the dpp everybody was saying we are institutionally racist uh, almost they were almost jumping on a bandwagon they felt so proud about being able to say that uh, and then their response was um some diversity training uh maybe a diversity officer uh a little bit more of that a little bit more of this uh, and as you appreciate 20 years later we haven't got much further forward um it was uh it was, we missed the moment then. You had Damalola Taylor, another young boy being murdered. Missed that moment. Anthony Walker in Liverpool, missed that moment. Uh, yeah, there are plenty of occasions, sadly, where you think this is a pivotal change. This will change the way things are, and they don't. And it's because we have poor leadership. I mean, even when I was chief prosecutor, you know, I was getting it in the neck on a regular basis. You know, every time the newspaper used to report, they would say, the Muslim chief prosecutor. You know, my faith doesn't, doesn't define me. It refines me, but it doesn't define me. They were very keen to, to paint the picture that Nazir, look, Nazir has reached this, uh, this position, therefore there's no racism. Yet I, they, don't, they don't pay attention to all the racism that I've had to encounter and deal with. Uh, I got more hate mail uh, on a, than any other prosecutor in this country. 
on a regular basis, even when I successfully prosecuted, say, the um, Rothschild grooming gang, I had the far right demonstration outside of my home. I had 17,000 emails sent to me calling for me to be sacked and deported. My kids could only go to school in a taxi for three months. I had to teach my children how to use a panic alarm that the police had put in my house. You know, in all those circles, even when you get everything right, um, there are people that are prepared or want to belittle you, hurt you, um, throw things at you, et cetera, et cetera. And that will only change when the whole system changes. And, you know, what um, Kevin will may, may or may, not, may know, I'm sure he does, is that there's only been ever one black chief constable in our history, uh, Mike Fuller in Kent, and he retired 10 years ago. Uh, so, uh, so there were no, you know, the, the, the policing at the highest ranks is not representative. You got 1% of judges from minority backgrounds, very few uh, QCs, very few senior barristers, very few heads of probation. Until last year, there was not one member of the parole board from a minority background. It tells you we're still on a massive journey. And uh, until somebody somewhere, uh, and by that I mean our prime minister and uh, I, those who really lead this country, pulls it by the bootstraps and says, right, we're gonna make a difference. There will be no difference. There will be another Stephen Lawrence, Anthony Walker, Damalola Taylor. They're etched on my brain and they'll always be etched on my brain. Mm. One of the very powerful terms that you use, Nazir, in, in the book is um, this term gender terrorism. Um, and you do write about the impact of your mother in your life and how you came to see the patriarchal systems of your upbringing, as plenty of people are familiar with across, you know, any endless amount of backgrounds and upbringings and so on. But there's an interesting part where you, I can't remember who you're, who you're speaking with, but um, there's kind of these five main priorities of crimes that want yeah. to be dealt with. And you basically said, well, actually, you can deal with terrorism, homicide, and organized crime by focusing mm. on violence against women and girls. Yeah. Oh, that was great to master police, would you believe it? Yeah. Um, given what Kevin just said. Yeah, absolutely. There was a... There was a list of their priorities, terrorism being number one, serious organized crime, number two, you know, well, you name it, they had all, and about number seven was violence against women and girls. But I don't know if you've read Joan Smith's book um, about the homegrown terrorism. You know, if you look at the backgrounds of virtually everybody involved in violent extremism, uh, you will see misogyny. You will see their treatment of women and girls. And I prosecuted this gang of, there's no other way of putting it, uh, potential terrorists in East London. And uh, we couldn't prosecute them for um, terrorism offenses because there wasn't enough evidence. But what we were able to collect is enough evidence for the way they were treating women and girls, the rapes, sexual abuse, etc. And we prosecuted for that. We disrupted their, their behaviors. They went to jail for 10 years. And so if, if you want to be able to deal with all serious crime, you can deal with violence against women and girls to get there. And uh, it, uh, you know, the figures speak for themselves. When you know, when I, people get upset when I talk about gender terrorism, as if somehow um, you know you're you're painting all men uh, as bad guys. No, I don't. Um, but somebody is responsible for two women uh, being killed every week, and that went up to five women a week during lockdown. Somebody's responsible for one in four women uh, suffering sexual assaults. One in five being stalked. Um, you know, the the ex the extent of the problem uh, is enormous, and more often, than, more often than not, when you look back at the, the backgrounds of, of serious offenders that aren't specifically uh, gender terrorism, you will see misogyny. Mm -hmm. And uh, how you prevent and tackle these crimes, um, yes, you can police your way out of it somehow, but you can prevent it by, by identifying all of these signs that, that we touch on or you just mentioned, because I think that's the way we'll prevent harm in the first place. Mm. Equally, I think um, when you kind of look at like you know i suppose people who may be predicated to do a serious crime i don't know if that's even an ethical thing to kind of frame but but within kind of extremism is also homophobia you know mm. and um i think that when we look at let's say quote unquote mass shootings in the us you know there's often <coughs> issues of violence against women um or homophobic you know splurging across the internet or whatever before um, the, the much more serious crimes are committed, although all of those crimes are serious. But 
Um, for you, Kevin, like you found yourself on, you know, what was known as, as Brutal Street uh, as a policing court, policing LGBT social enclaves in Manchester where homophobia in, in the police was, was rife. Um, I cannot imagine how uh, internally confrontational that process um, was for, for, for a gay man. I mean, um, obviously it was difficult and I'm just like thinking on some of the amazing points uh, Nazir uh, uh, has said. I mean, you know, just before I answer that, like, in my book, you can see my mum's influence throughout. You know, I, we had such a, my siblings and I had such a strong influence in our mother. And I don't say this lightly, I think if women run the world, we'd have less violence and less trouble. You know, my, my whole moral, I guess, integrity it came from a strong woman. You know, I mentioned earlier about, you know, the difference between uh, uh, right and wrong and, you know, I, I, I've alluded to it quite a bit in the um, in during this conversation about, you know, my mum keep me on the right track. And that was why I, I do believe her influence made me want to join the police and, and make a difference. And, you know, and as he talked about leadership, we do need an entire structural change. But what I say is, you know, we need to recruit people who think differently, not just look differently. And just like, you know, a point on that, you know, I was asked recently, oh, we've progressed you know, Nazi has talked about it, we've not progressed hardly enough. You know, 20 years after the report into the McPherson, uh, um, the report into the McPherson report into Stephen Lawrence's um, killing, you know, in Britain, if you're black, you're nine times uh, more likely to be stopped and searched than if you're white, four times more likely to be tasered, four times more likely to be detained under the Mental Health Act, twice as likely to die in police custody with the use of force or restraint, and overall, half of our young people in young offenders institutes are uh, institutions are black or brown. You know, is that, I said recently, is that progress? How can the stats be worse 20 years on for our younger black and Asian people in, in this country? I mean, it's dreadful. It's, it's, it's shameful when you think about it. But, you know, going to the point of your question about homophobia, I often thought if I was maybe just one black or gay, I may have survived, but I think that combination was just too much. People like me didn't exist. And we're talking about the 21st century. You know, there was no other black gay cops around. You know, if it wasn't racism, it was homophobia. And um, Nazir, you know, he was one of the, uh, the leaders doing this, you know, and changing the law and, you know, implementing it in terms of um, legislation. You know, a lot of people think, oh, we reached the promised land um, a long time ago with regards to sexual orientation. The Sexual Offences Act uh, wasn't repealed until 2003. You know, it didn't come into law until 2004. I'd been serving for three years up until that point. People assume that when I joined, we were all skipping around holding hands and it was a safe place for LGBT people. You know, homophobia was just a regular occurrence, like racism. And, you know, I often say, you know, jobs are hard at the best of times, all jobs, you know, whatever it may be. But I wasn't just going home with the baggage of the job, like, oh, I may have dealt with a child death that day. I was going home with the added baggage of racism and homophobia I'd heard. So for me, I often found it lonely because if I wasn't hearing racism, I was hearing homophobia. And there's a problem with it with racism in the LGBT community. You know, seven out of uh, seven out of ten Black and Asian men uh, have experienced racism in the um, LG, in the gay community on the scene, you know, on apps and stuff. So, you know, in wider society, I didn't feel safe. Let's use that word. And even in um, uh, in a uh, you know uh, community who knows oppression, I didn't feel safe either. So, yeah. You know, I wonder whether the path for me was already laid out, you know, in terms of my intersectionality, being a black gay guy, it was just too much for too many people. I mean, you know, you've read the book, a lot of people put the onus on, on me of uh, the problem of race and homophobia on me. Like, I've got to change it, or I've got to change my behaviour. I should be allowed to bring my true self to work. You know, 
my white straight colleagues are allowed to be themselves. So most roles I was in, I was only, I was often the only um, um, a black officer and definitely the only gay officer in my last role in the Met in the counter-terrorism command. You know, there was 200 detectives. There was two black officers and I didn't know of any other um, um, out gay officer out of 200. And we're not talking like 20 years ago, we're talking like a few years ago. So, you know, Nadia said, you know, we haven't, we haven't progressed uh, far enough. And when we say we have, we're just kidding ourselves. Did you notice signs or recognize signs of your own institutionalization within the police force? Yeah, you know, I, I talk about this in the book, you know, and there's been people I've stopped and my behavior towards them has been un, um, unbecoming. You know, I, I, I write about a, a young black uh, lad I stopped in Manchester. And I was, I, to this day, I feel shameful what I said to him. I stopped him doing a lawful uh, vehicle, uh, you know, a document check. And he complained to me that the only reason I was stopping him was because of the color of his skin, because he was a young black man. And I didn't realize until writing the book, Reflection, that actually he didn't see another black guy. What he saw was someone dressed in blue, clubbed in blue. You know, I was blue to him, not black. And what I said to him, if you don't like living in this country, why don't you go and live somewhere else? I said that to him because I'd hear that language, um, that language before. In Heathrow, I was very forceful with an Asian passenger that I stopped. Um, because again, trying to prove something to your colleagues, my sergeant patted me on the back, you know, for being aggressive uh, in, a, in a nutshell, you know, with the passenger. And these things, you know, you've asked me this question, these things are not, they're not part of my general nature. That's not why I joined the police. I didn't join to, you know, uh, to abuse my uh, powers or, you know, to be, um, you know, just, 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 just time to be forceful, you know, in, in, in a job, as, particularly in policing, you know, when someone's resisting arrest. But, you know, I, I didn't go there, I didn't join the police to oppress people. So, yeah, there was occasions where uh, I fell short, but that was because, I uh, quickly became institutionalized. Um, in many of our great and old institutions, you know, you become part of the culture very, very quickly. You know, in the police used to call it the canteen culture, where, you know, the unwritten rules of police are not discussed. Mm. Can we jump to another jurisdiction for a second? Because it's obviously something a lot of people are thinking about and, and discussing in, uh, at the moment with the movement um, and the discourse in the US to defund the police, um, this sense that something that is so has never been properly addressed and if anything, the kind of um, supremacist structures and almost like slavery legacy within the policing institution aided uh, a lot of the time um, by Irish Americans, uh, it must be said, you know, um, uh, certainly in, in places like New York, Boston, Chicago, where it often feels that every second police officer has an, has an Irish surname. And we, you know, they're, that thing of, of emigrating from somewhere where you feel oppressed and then perpetrating oppression on others is, is a common diasporic trajectory sometimes. But that um, sense, which, you know, the likes of, you know, Angela Davis or someone has been talking about for, for decades to defund the police, that if something is so sick, it has to be fundamentally taken apart, an entirely new system has to be imagined. Um, is that the way forward for the, for the states? If something is so, I mean, you know, the police can't not do police brutality at police brutality protests. You know, they just seem to be incapable of managing themselves or behaving in any decent way. For my for my part, uh, you know, uh, we thankfully we have a very different system in the UK. Where we are based on uh, policing by consent. Uh, you know, our system is based on the the principle that the public are the police, the police are the public. The United States is a very different kettle of fish, which I think you've identified just a moment ago. The idea that um, it's very militarized. Uh, I think the fact that everybody's got arms has an impact on that too. Uh, in the New York State alone last year, they paid $230 million in compensation to people that were the victims of, uh, of misconduct by the police. $230 million. I mean, that's, 
that's the budget of most police forces in the UK. Uh, and that's just what they paid in compensation in one state. Uh, and so um, the, I think that the that thing about defunding is that's the issue that I think you know, narratives are very difficult to, to express. And I think what, what you, the way you've described it is the way it should be. Namely, I think that the system they have in the States cannot operate the way it can, currently does without completely re-engineering it. Uh, it doesn't mean, the way it's been articulated by, by the politics but in an election year uh, is uh, they don't want police at all, you know, uh, which is um, complete nonsense, but that's how it's been articulated. But I very much believe, and I've, I've worked very closely, and I'm sure Kevin has as well, with American police. And, and you, you know, you, when you talk to senior officers and you're talking to the FBI and others, uh, they get what they're talking about. They're very good at what they do. They have access to the best technology and, and some of the best science. Um, but when it comes down to the officer on the street, uh, there are plenty, sadly, of examples of misconduct, uh, which suggests to me that they've got the system slightly wrong. Uh, and that's skewed in such a way that the public don't see them as working for them, but working against them. Mm. What do you think about that, Kevin? I mean, I recently I'm um, doing interviews and stuff. I've been asked quite a bit, having stirred for 11 years, about whether we should uh, defund in this country. And my answer is always the same. You know, as he has mentioned, you know, we, uh, the difference between our, uh, you know, uh, America and Britain in terms of uh, policing. Uh, for me, to talk about a new s sort of style of policing, we have to know an alternative. I hear a lot of talk about defund the police, but I don't see much of well, this is what's going to be in its place. And one of the examples I give, if my grandma is being burgled tonight, if the police are not coming to help her, who's coming? And that's, you know, some of the answers we've not uh, uh, got to yet in terms of what, you know, in America, and even if the conversation grew here, which I can't really see it, but there is a movement in this country with regards to defund the police, but I want to know, um, I don't like to talk about things I don't know. So if we're going to talk about defunding the police, what's the alternative? Hmm. But one thing I will say um, in response to, not to Nazir, but in response to something he, he said, to, to the average person on the street, they see so many similarities between police in America and uh, the UK. That's why the Black Lives Matter movement in this country is just, I've never seen anything take off so powerfully. So many white people on the streets alongside black and brown people in towns and cities across the UK saying, you know, uh, loud and proud, Black Lives Matter. It's not about the CPS or the police, but when we're talking about brutality and, you know, the murder of black men in America, a lot of people refer to deaths in custody in this, in this country, particularly England and Wales, because that's the jurisdiction um, uh, for the CPS. You know, since 1990, I talk about this in the book, uh, 1,600 people, over 1,600 people have died in police custody or having come into contact with police officers in England and Wales. And there's never been a conviction. Now, there's lots of reasons why, you know, the Zia's will be an expert on all these, not all the cases, but you know, in terms of reasons why and stuff, but it doesn't uh, make sense or it's not uh, good enough for the families whose loved one has died in these incidents or for the wider public when they see, well, actually, I mean, I speak to many people about like deaths in custody and you know, the stats I talked to you before about uh, arrest, tasering and stop and search. And people say, with regards to deaths in custody, I didn't know that. I didn't know in England and Wales since the 1990s, um, over 1,600 people have died and there's never been a conviction. So that's what a lot of people, the Black Lives Matter movement in the UK are linking with regards to America. You know, is that a lot of people see us as, as fundamentally not different apart from the fact that our officers on mainland Britain anyway, don't routinely carry firearms. So although our systems may be different, you know, there is, I, I mean, I actually agree there is similarities with regards to uh, uh, policing on both sides of the Atlantic. And we shouldn't really forget that the modern police forces were set up or based on the principles of Peel, Robert Peel. You know, when, you know, uh, with the influence around uh, the Americas, particularly the North and um, the Empire, the British Empire. Hmm. I want to just ask something before we're, we're um, 
coming towards the end of our conversation, which has really been fascinating. And thanks so much again for your time. You know, um, Kevin, you just endured an, an awful lot um, while trying to do the right thing. And Nazir, sometimes, to be perfectly honest, I actually had to put the book down because the details of a particular case was so uh, abhorrent, really. Um, and that's not hyperbole like that. It, that is how I was feeling sometimes. So that's me reading something. You know, I don't know what it was like to be in, in the granular uh, aspect of it. What do you think? both think has been a good learning for you both in terms of looking after your emotional and mental health? Shall I go first, Nazir, or do you want to yeah, think on you? Kevin. No, no. Go for it, <laughs> Kevin, go for it. I mean, for me, you know, I, it was really important for me that I, um, you know, almost got rid of my demons, got it down on paper, you know, Writing the book for me was very therapeutic. You know, it was also hell, but it was good for me to get it down on paper and for my voice to be heard. And, and also, you know, to be a voice for the voiceless. You know, it's, if just one person uh, uh, reads my book and, you know, resonates and maybe things are better for him or her because they can do things differently, then, you know, my job, my job's done. But... Something you've just said uh, about uh, Nazir's book is that um, a lot of people have contacted me saying that some people couldn't read my book all in one go. They had to stop at certain points and put it down, not because it was uh, an awful book, but because it was too much for them. And what I yeah. almost want to say, and this will be uh, similar for him as well, is that, you know, we're writing about it. Imagine experiencing it, you know, in terms of the cases, the racism, the homophobia. I mean, you're a woman, you, you know, you'll know oppression, but I'm just saying, you know, people say, oh, I, I couldn't get through two chapters without having a break. And I'm like, well, actually, you know, living it, you don't get a break. And, yeah. But you don't say that because you don't want to be, you know, you know, people are taking the time to, you know, invest in you by, you know, reading your book and stuff. So you don't want to be like rude. But I guess for me, you know, it was, it was a good way of containing, I guess, not the, um, the best part of, uh, of my of, of my past but you know finishing on a positive note you know not every day was awful you know and for me it's about like I'm sitting here with you with you both now it's about turning this around and trying to continue to do uh, some good like I'm looking at issues now with regards to homelessness and housing and loneliness and loss because I'm trying to expand the conversation you know I did my bit I joined you know I've written the book to try and you know again continue to play my bar play my part to make the police force better. And yeah, I've done, I've done my bit. For me now it's about moving on, changing the story, rebuilding my life and trying to, you know, be happy with what years um, I've got left. But to finish, it was really important that I got my story done. And um, I told it, like Nazir, you know, our stories now are now part of history. You know, they'll, they'll be around, uh, hopefully, you know, in a cupboard somewhere a lot longer than, than um, him, the both of us. <laughs> Fair play. <laughs> uh, for, I mean, for my part, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, I write about how uh, when you've watched a, a baby being raped on a video, uh, that your world can't remain the same and you go home and, and you hug your own children, uh, but you go back to work the next day and carry on. Uh, I've, I told you earlier on about when the fire right were outside my door, I spent all my years trying to keep the work away from my family. Suddenly they're here. Uh, how I ended up on an Al Qaeda death list uh, 15 years ago and more recently which is not in the book of course I lost my brother to COVID uh, and the work I've been doing to try and bring this government to account uh, for what they have done in response to COVID um, I always put myself out there you know? I'm, I'm not slightest bit concerned about my own welfare I know for a fact that were it not for my family and my dear friends uh, I would have gone under a long long time ago um, I don't know whether the book was a reflective process. Well, it was a reflective process, but was it a cathartic process? Not entirely sure about that. Mm. I think the fact that I am surrounded by the people that I'm surrounded by, and the fact that I'm uh, very vocal and very open, um, and, the, and my upbringing. You know, uh, I write about how my, we, were, we lost relatives to, the, to uh, terrorism, how we, uh, you know, my cousin dies in my arm. All of that stuff must make you stronger, even when you don't know it does. Uh, and uh, the people I was surrounded by, people I work with, people I live with, 
uh, other people have kept me going. Mm. Well, just thank you so much for your brilliant writing. It's so instructive, and although it can be can be, you know, difficult to 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 read, obviously, as you say, Kevin, so much more difficult to live. But I think there are testimonies of of human resilience and courage and 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 uh, trying, you know, um, which is just so important and of spirit. So they are forced out, and the prosecutor do buy them. And uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I really appreciate it. And all the best going forward. You're welcome. Thank you both.